Hey, Bowtie Nation, Joseph Hogue here. Uh, thank you for joining us. Getting started uh, an hour late this week because of daylight savings time, but normally at 9 a.m. Eastern time every Monday, uh, bringing to you these uh, weekly market updates, getting you ready for the week with what I'm watching, what to watch in stocks, as well as some of the specific stocks I'm watching. Uh, love this face-to-face -face connection we can get with these live streams. Uh, make sure, uh, let me know that if I'm coming through all right and you can hear me okay in the chat there. Uh, but yeah, just love these, uh, you know, love these back and forths we have every Monday, getting you ready for, for the week. Uh, and what a week it it's, looks like it's going to be, you know, uh, with the Ukraine situation is just throwing inflation uh, into a, a tailspin. I think we're going to get very much higher inflation than we were expecting earlier in the year. That's actually going to start bleeding into consumer confidence, consumer spending, and a lot of other things that uh, could make this market uh, pretty pretty tough. You know, Goldman Sachs actually just uh, just upped its odds of recession to 35% and downgraded its um, its price prediction for the S and P 500 and for the rest of the market uh, last week. I think all of uh, you know, all, a lot of the other bulge bracket banks and the other analysts are bringing their expectations down and things like that. So I want to talk about, you know, a couple things this week, this this week, uh, besides just the normal weekly stock market update we do. I want to share a specific strategy of how to invest in this market, how to think about this market and, and what to do, because I think, you know, it's going to help release a lot of the anxiety and a lot of the fear that a lot of investors have, um, you know, looking at stocks, looking at the markets, you know, close lower every single day. Dow is down five weeks in a row so far, and uh, it might not be any relief this week either. So I want to share that strategy with you right off the bat here. Um, because I don't think you should ever really time the market. You know, you've got a lot of YouTubers out there uh, saying, you know, just panicking and selling all their stocks. Of course, uh, after they do that, the stock market starts going up. They panic the other way around, like they're missing out on something. They buy back in, and then the stock market does end up going down some more. So, you know, a lot of a lot of bad advice here on on YouTube from uh, people that. Have ne actually never really witnessed a stock or been investing in a stock market crash. You got to watch out, folks. Uh, a lot of people don't really know the, the fear and the pain of watching their stocks go down 40 and 50 percent in an overall broader stock market crash. Um, so they panic. They panic really easily. They sell out. I don't want you to panic. I don't want you to have that anxiety uh, from watching the stock. So I'm going to share exactly what I'm doing and how to invest to really get the best of both worlds, to be able to take advantage of lower prices now just in case stocks do come back up, uh, but also you know set yourself up to take advantage of a further stock market, market crash if this whole situation does uh, indeed get worse. And what I want to... Uh, and so, so far, the NASDAQ, the tech stocks in the NASDAQ down more than 20% uh, from their peak. So that is a bear market. That is technically 20% down from the peak is a bear market. The S&P 500 is down about 12.7% from its, uh, I believe, November highs. Uh, so in correction territory, not quite a crash just yet or a bear market, but um, it could get there. You know, as I said, the... Um, and some of the things we'll we'll talk about today, you know, the the surge in gasoline and oil prices, as well as the surge in agricultural prices, uh, wheat and other commodities, it is really throwing inflation uh, higher over the next months. Uh, inflation came in last week. The CPI, the Consumer Price Index, was up to uh, seven point seven point nine percent, I believe, a new forty year high. Uh, it's pro it's likely going to be upwards of nine percent next month. Okay, when they report. You know the the consumer prices uh, and the price inflation due to a lot of this gasoline and and the uh, the other the other commodities increases. It's uh, likely going to mean that inflation is with us for longer. And there are two main factors really. If you look past, if you look back to World War II, in fact, uh, there are two main factors that have thrown us into a recession. One is a commodity price shock. Okay, when uh, you know oil prices go up significantly very quickly, when agricultural prices go up, things like that. And two is a Fed rate hike cycle. And you know, you know that we're getting that first of the Fed rate hike cycle this week. The Federal Reserve meets on uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, closes up Wednesday, and is widely expected to raise rates by a quarter of a percent. Uh, we'll talk about that more uh, in a little bit too. But obviously, you know, 
lifting borrowing costs, making it more expensive to borrow. Uh, so obviously that brings down uh, economic growth. So those are the two main factors a lot of times that, that have thrown us into, the, into a recession, and we're seeing both of them right now. So again, odds of a recession are, are uh, increasing. I honestly, I don't think uh, the stock market sell-off is over yet, but I don't want you to panic and I don't want you to sell out of all your stocks, okay? That is not the way to do. You know, rates are increasing, but uh, it's gonna take a long time for that to weigh on the economy. And in fact, uh, we're right around zero now. We're expected to be about a quarter percent uh, on interest rates when the Fed does hike on Wednesday. Uh, but there's data out there that says rates and interest rates really don't affect the economy so much until they get to as high as three or four percent. So we've got a long way to go until the interest rates actually start hitting the economy. You know what is actually what actually usually happens is the market stock market is rising during that Fed rate hike cycle as rates are going up because. Uh, you know, because the economy is still good. The, eco the economy is still strong enough that the Fed can raise rates, okay? So the, the market is usually doing well. Uh, the reason why it falls before the rate, rate hike cycle begins, as we've seen over the last few months, uh, besides the Ukraine situation, of course, is because investors, uh, Investors build that into the stock price. They build in the uh, pessimism and the negative sentiment over those rate hikes and, and over higher borrowing costs. Okay, so usually what we get is a, a sell off on the rumor or on the, the build up to rate hikes, and then, you know, and then stocks build back up while they're actually hiking rates. Of course, that's probably not going to happen this time because we also have the Ukraine situation and rising inflation from that. But the consumer is still fairly strong. Uh, businesses are still very strong. Uh, you know, so so uh, it's, there's not necessarily a 100% chance of a recession or a 100% chance that, that stocks continue to fall from here. Uh, stocks are actually getting pretty uh, pr pretty nicely, uh, nicely valued. I want to look in here to... Uh, you know, if you look at uh, stocks in the S&P 500, they are trading right now at about 18.5 uh, times on a price to earnings basis. Uh, that is right at the five year average. At one point last year at the peak, we were trading at around 22, 23 times on a price to earnings basis, which is extremely expensive. Uh, now they are down to that five year average and actually only about 9% higher than the 16.5, 16.9 times average that we've had over the last 10 years. So stocks are no longer expensive. They're, no, they're not necessarily cheap uh, you know, on that 10-year average basis, but they're not expensive now. And, and I don't want you to jump out of the market. You know, it's, it's always fashionable. You're gonna hear uh, YouTubers, you're gonna hear people on CNBC, on Bloomberg, all the pundits, it's fashionable to say, you know, uh, uh, things, things are looking bad now. Next couple of months is uncertain, okay? They always leave it kind of vague, uh, but the second half of the year looks better, okay? And, you know, they, they leave it vague like this because, who the hell is going to remember what they said when the second half of the year comes by? Okay, so they can always say, um, well, I told you so. I told you it would get better in the second half or or even before that. I'm not fashionable you, except for my choice in bow ties. So I'm going to tell you exactly what I'm doing right now. You know, uh, I am still, you, you've got to invest every month. Okay, you put your money in from your paychecks, put a, a con consistent amount of your money into your investing account every single month, okay? You need to get in that habit, stay in that ha habit of growing your portfolio. That doesn't mean you actually need to invest that money. That doesn't mean you need to be buying all the time. I see too many investors, they get itchy trigger fingers uh, when they have cash sitting in their account and everything looks like a good deal, right? They watch, uh, you know, they, they make their deposit from their, uh, you know, their weekly or biweekly or, or monthly paycheck or whatever. Uh, they make their deposit into their investing account and then they go immediately to CNBC or immediately to YouTube and look for stocks to buy, right? And, uh, and they pick one or two, maybe they even give it a day at the most to, uh, you know, to look it over and to think about it, but then boom, they're, they're all in. They're 100% invested into stocks, you know, every time they deposit money. Um, and obviously, you know, that's just, just setting yourself up, self up for buying at the top as well and, uh, and kind of missing out on some of the opportunities we get when the market is down 10 or 20%. Right, so I do want you to stay in that habit of depositing money every single month 
into your investing account, okay? But, but you can let it build up in cash, and this is what I'm doing. I'm actually taking half of that money I deposit each month, and I'm buying some of these, uh, some of these growth stocks that have already sold off 70, 60, 70, 80%, okay? Things like Teladoc, things like PayPal, and I know a lot of you, uh, a lot of you have been burned by PayPal and uh, some of these other growth stocks, but right now they are at extremely good valuations, I gotta tell you. Uh, <clears throat> these are still, these are still the same companies they were a year ago, two years ago, when they were at valuations two and three times this. Okay, they are still companies that are going to change the way we live over the next ten years, uh, and I think you want to be a part of that. Okay, and whereas last year I was saying there was no way in hell I was investing in these at those valuations, now we're at valuations well under ten times on a price to sales basis. These companies are still growing at twenty and thirty uh, percent, you know, annual revenue growth. Uh, so I truly believe and now is the time to to start take getting a position and building your position into these growth stocks okay when everyone else is selling out basically okay don't never forget that Amazon and we've talked about this on the uh, on the channel before Amazon shares of Amazon went public in uh, I think 97 1997 at the peak of that uh, that dot com bubble fell 95% you know, from from about $120 a share in 1999 to uh, to $5 and 60 cents a share by about 2001, 2002, fell 95%. Investors that had bought at that peak were just despondent. You know, 95% loss on your portfolio. Imagine that. But if you had hold, held on, you held on, or better yet, bought at that low when everyone else was selling, then shares are now up about $3,000. Okay. So you have made, I mean, you could have been a millionaire off of maybe a, a $5,000, $10,000 uh, investment in the shares at that time. So, you know, just uh, just kind of a perspective here on some of these growth stocks that have fallen so much, you know, keep your, keep your perspective, research the companies, uh, and you'll see that a lot of these companies, they've got great futures ahead, uh, even though, you know, sentiment is clearly negative on them right now. So that's what I'm doing right now. I am uh, depositing my money each month, Buying, using half of it to buy in and build that position in these growth stocks, and the other half is sitting in cash for better opportunities. Okay, because again, I think this could get worse before it gets better. Uh, you know, Putin is in no position to negotiate, uh, no position of strength to negotiate anyway. Uh, rather, in even though he said last week that uh, talks were being making progressive progress or, or good progress in talks, the Ukraine ambassador said that Russia is just in its own reality as far as what it wants out of the negotiation, right? So Russia is playing hardball. Uh, the West, NATO, and a lot of those powers, they're not going to give uh, Russia everything it wants. Uh, so we have to find that, that, that point where everybody is legitimately and seriously willing to negotiate. And I just don't think we're there yet. I don't think uh, Russia is going to negotiate until it is ha has, has a much stronger hand in Ukraine, possibly even uh, occupying Kiev uh, and that. So I think this does get worse, uh, you know. Even if even if we do reach some kind of a negotiated settlement or uh, progress towards that, I think inflation is really going to become a problem. Obviously, those gas prices, you know, they're only going up, uh, and I think it's going to start hitting consumer sentiment, which of course is the big factor for the U.S. economy. U.S. economy, 70% is uh, based on consumer spending. Uh, so once you get uh, consumer confidence coming down, once you get consumer spending coming down because of that inflation, uh, then then you really start to see the, the economy kind of tumble a little bit and, and possibly even a recession. So what I'm doing is, uh, you know, I'm watching, and this is something, another, uh, or strategy we've talked about on the channel before is making your markers uh, when you're going to use that cash. Okay, I'm waiting till the S and P with that cash gets down another. Uh, you know, it's down 12.7 percent right now from its peak. If it falls to 38.50, so if the S and P 500 index falls to 38.50, that would be 20 percent from the high. That would be a bear market for the S and P 500 for the broad stock market. And at that point, I'm going to deploy half of the cash that I've got saved up. Okay, at that point. I'm going to go back through my portfolio, look at the stocks that I really like, uh, some of the stocks that maybe I'm a little bit underweighted on, and, and I'm going to use half my cash to buy back, buy more into those stocks, obviously at a lower price and take advantage of that. Um, now, if the S&P keeps falling, if it falls further uh, and falls 25% from its peak, that would be a range of around 3,600 for the S&P 500. So it would be down 25%. At that point, I'm going to use the rest of my cash. You know, so so I'm going to use the rest of my cash, buy back into a, a lot of those same stocks, uh, and 
everybody always wants to find the next hot stock, the next stock they want to buy. But, but folks, I got to tell you, a lot of times the best stock to buy is already in your portfolio. You know, it's already the stock that you really love, the company that you really love, the company that you spent the most time researching and looking at, you've got the most faith that in, and uh, you know, against all these other stocks that you bought and sold, you've kept this one stock or this one group of stocks. So look into your portfolio, see which companies that you've held the longest, you really like them, you really think they have a great future, and, uh, and use your cash to buy into those. But not until you know, not until you reach those those markers, uh, you know, where you want to be, where you think the, the market wants to be, uh, and that's not to say that I'm gonna find the exact bottom of of the stock market. I don't necessarily think that the stock market, the S and P 500, is gonna go down 25 or, or even 30 percent or or anything from its peak. But I want to be ready in case it does. You know, with this with this strategy, it does a couple of things for me. A few things. One is, you know, I'm still investing. I, I'm still buying some of those growth stocks that I really like. So in case we do get a market bounce uh, and some relief, then then you know I, I've got some some money working for me. I've got some stocks working for me. Okay. And before the whole Ukraine situation, I did think we could get some relief this month, starting with that Fed rate hike cycle. Because again, a lot of times what you see is stocks crash, stocks fall or sell off ahead of the actual start to the rate hike cycle to the to the Fed raising interest rates uh, in anticipation there. But then they re- you get a relief rally afterwards, and stocks do rise during that rate hike cycle while the Fed is raising rates. Okay, and that was kind of the the kind of the strategy until the Ukraine situation happened, and and of course that's thrown everything up into uh, up in, into into the air. But that's what uh, so that's what I want. I want some of my cash or some of my cash working for me in those growth stocks. Some of it set aside. Uh, but the bigger picture here, the bigger, the, the more importantly here, I think with this strategy and setting these points. So when you know, okay, at this point, if the S and P five hundred or any index, if any index falls, you know, to this point, that's when I'm going to start using the rest of this cash. It's going to release. It's going to relieve a lot of the anxiety and the fear and the constant worrying about the market. Okay, I see too many investors. Like I said, they they deposit their money and then they go immediately to CNBC and try finding five stocks to buy and they buy all those and then they're immediately they they have that buyer's regret. Right? Um, should I have bought right now? Is the market going to keep on going down? They watch the market every day, uh, wanting to try to get in at the lows. And uh, it can make you go old early, kids. Uh, seriously, you don't want that kind of anxiety. You don't want that kind of stress in your life. So what this does, it tells you exactly when you're going to start deploying that cash. Okay, you don't need to worry about the market every single day because you've got cash set aside just in case it does keep on going. And you know when you're going to start using that cash. Okay, so use a strategy like this. It's not only a good strategy for putting some of your money to work now, having some of it uh, set on the sides that to take advantage of a bigger drop, but it's also going to relieve a lot of that anxiety and the fear you have about watching the market and getting in at the right times. So I want to uh, I want to start uh, you know I want to look at the markets, look at some of the things I'm watching this week, uh, kind of get you ready for the week and some of the stocks that we're watching. So I'm going to. Uh, going to turn it over here first I do want to uh, I do want to invite you to get the the daily boat or the weekly bow tie right that is our uh, our weekly newsletter it's uh, goes out every Sunday night uh, before the market opens the next day really gets you gets you ready for the week it's everything that I'm watching all the markets the market updates the news strategy trends uh, it's all completely free and so I've put the uh, the link to sign up for that in the chat box. I'll also put it in the description below and in the first comment. Click through, sign up. It's totally free. Like I said, just something I like to do for all you out there in the community. Uh, let you know what to do, uh, what to watch for the week. But I do want to uh, I do want to get started on our uh, you know seeing seeing where the market is. The market does look like it is going to uh, going to open higher. For the week, uh, they sold off, stocks sold off, and the sell-off really accelerated last week. Uh, investors kind of threw up their hands and and cashed out and are waiting for less uncertainty. But like I said, uh, you know, stocks are looking good here. Uh, stocks in the S&P 500 again now trading at about 18.5 times on that forward price to earnings basis. Okay, so that's the price of the S&P 5. All the stocks in that 500 uh, 500 largest stocks index, right? That's the price divided by the earnings that analysts expect over the next year. Okay, 18 and a half times. That is right, just actually just below the five-year average ratio. Okay, but still about nine and a half percent more expensive than the 10-year average at 16.9 times. Okay, now 
on a $226 in expected earnings for, for all the stocks in the S&P 500. Uh, for the rest of the year, the S&P would need to drop about 9.2% to 3819, okay, 3819 on the S&P 500 to trade at that 10-year average. Okay, so so again, stocks are no longer expensive, but they aren't they aren't necessarily cheap either. Uh, oil, obviously, oil surged last week to $130 a barrel before falling back to about $109. Oil down 6.4% today uh, to $102 a barrel, and this is really, uh, you know, this is really the the uh, the the risk okay and the danger of following these trends uh, you know because once they've happened they've already happened uh, okay a lot of investors I I know got really excited about oil last week when it was at 130 even when it closed at 110 thought uh, thought it was going to go back up to 150 and and 200 and they got excited and now look it's down 6.4 percent today gold down one and a third percent. And you got to understand a lot of these, there's something you, you need to do here with these commodities is not necessarily play the commodity commodity itself. OK, so you're not buying crude, you're not buying gold, you're not buying, uh, you know, some of the uh, the oil oil funds, OK, like the USO. But you can still get a lot of that upside appreciation and the safety in some of these miners, okay, um, even if uh, so, both of these commodity prices, crude and gold, looking extremely stretched at these prices, okay, especially gold, where it took a threats of a world war to move it out of that range where it's been over the last two years, okay. The gold has been in a range from seventeen hundred fifty to around eighteen hundred fifty dollars an ounce over the last two years, despite inflation being at 40 year highs. Okay, it took a world war to get it up to uh, right around $2,000 an ounce again. Uh, So gold, obviously expensive right now. But even if uh, these commodity prices come down, the miners, the oil explorers are still cash flow companies. Okay, they are still cash flow machines. A lot of the uh, you know, a lot of the gold miners sitting at about a twelve hundred dollar uh, all-in sustaining costs. Okay, so now that's the that's the cost of gold or the price of gold they need to be profitable, including their uh, production, their capital expenditures for maintenance expenditures, that kind of thing. Um, so at at gold, even if gold comes down to eighteen hundred dollars an ounce, that is still like a six hundred dollar an ounce profit for these gold miners. Uh, so if you're if you're looking at the commodity space, if you're looking at crude, if you're looking at gold, look at the explorers and look at the miners instead, because I think those are going to be the real cash flow machines uh, this year. Interest rates, uh, interest rates went up, you know, actually climbed last week on that inflation. They're up another four percent today. This ten-year bond, the ten-year Treasury bond, up to two point one percent, almost up four point seven four percent. And this is going to be a big story for this year, folks. Uh, that inflation, like I said, inflation is going up. It's going to be surprisingly, shockingly bad next month. Okay, watch the CPI number, the Consumer Price Index next month. It's going to be up upwards of nine percent. Uh, it's going to be another forty plus year uh, r- record uh, because of the uh, because of the inflation we've seen in oil and gas and and that kind of thing over the past month. Um, and these interest rates these interest rates are really going to run higher. So we're going to talk about some stocks to watch and and how to invest for that as well. So I want to I do want to look at what to uh, what to watch for this week. <clears throat> Some of the some of the sectors and trends we can go here. Uh, this is the sector sectorspider.com. Of course, one of my favorite research tools. If you go here, sectorspider.com, you go to tools, you go to sector tracker. And this is just going to show you, uh, you know, what the stocks in each sector did uh, over the you know the last week, the month, one year, all the way up to five years. Really gives you a kind of a bird's eye view, a picture of you know how the sectors of the economy are doing and how to how to maybe uh, position your portfolio or or really where you want to find that safety if you uh, you know if you're looking for that. And of course, last week. Uh, Last week it was just the uh, the energy stocks man- that managed to close higher, closed higher by about two percent, uh, even even against those that fall in uh, oil. Okay, even even despite the the drop in the price of oil, energy stocks still managed to uh, to eke out a two percent gain. And again, this is what I'm talking about. Even if oil comes down, these energy companies, these oil explorers, are still in cash flow territory. They are still cash flow machines, uh, and they are still going to be making money. So these stocks are still in in fairly good value territory. If you want some safety, uh, just in case the uh, you know the the Ukraine situation gets worse, I think you can find it here in these energy stocks as well as uh, some of the gold the gold miners. Uh, one one thing was interesting: the consumer 
consumer staples. Okay, consumer staples had the worst sell-off of the uh, of the week, five down 5.8%. Uh, and of course, these are a lot of your food packaging, your food processors, uh, Kellogg's, ConAgra, things like that. And I think a lot of this was kind of that lower profitability on inflation, okay? We've already seen this over the last year. Consumer staples have really fallen hard uh, because it is, you know, although it is a, these are stocks selling things that you have to buy, that food, the personal products, household products, things that you need to buy. Uh, it is so competitive in that sector that they really don't have the pricing power that they need to pass on a lot of this inflation uh, to customers. Okay, if Kellogg raises the uh, raises the price of its you know sugar frosted bo crispy bombs, okay, if it raises the prices on that cereal, then um, then maybe General Mills doesn't look, raise the price quite as much on on their uh, you know shredded wheat, and and people flock to uh, to to change their their cereals, right? So that's what we've seen in a lot of these consumer staples companies. Uh, now, while the uh, the overall consumer staples sector is still 30% higher over the past five years, uh, you know, valuations in a lot of these are getting kind of attractive here. Uh, you know, so even though I do think inflation is going to run higher, I think this is the point where you can start to look at some of these consumer staples companies, these names. Uh, they're not going to make you rich. None of these are ever going to make you rich because they are that slow growth kind of a company like Kellogg's, like General Mills, like ConAgra, uh, but they pay some great dividends, okay, and very stable and constant dividends, okay, look at some of these, uh, look at some of these stocks, Altria Group, uh, of course, uh, Philip Morris paying a 7% dividend, Kraft Heinz paying a 4.3% dividend, ConAgra Brands paying 4.2% dividend, okay, some of these, the evaluations have gotten to a point where, where they are very attractive, and, and I think you can get in there, Keep uh, you know, start collecting those dividends and just wait for wait for the environment to get better and these uh, these stocks to, to go higher. Now, four of the eleven stock sectors are now down more than ten percent. We can go here to the year to date and see this, uh, and that's really crazy how how far energy has gone so far. Thirty nine percent in energy stocks so far this year. By far, obviously, you know, uh, just just blasting all the rest of the stocks but uh you know, relative outperformers uh, do do give you some ideas of you know how to play this market how to invest in this market utilities only down 1.6 percent okay so you know getting the getting that safety play in those utility companies obviously these are your electric providers natural gas things that you have to buy um, they're very rate sensitive so they were hurting uh, over the last year as interest rates went up, but they are they are the safe haven stocks right now. Those utilities, financials down six point eight percent, and this is actually one of my favorite sectors so far. I, we will talk about how uh, this probably some more pain over the next couple of months for the financials for the bank stocks because they do have a lot of exposure to Russia and to Russian debt. Okay, uh, among those, you know, you've got uh, BlackRock, you've got Citigroup. Citigroup actually has about ten billion dollars in uh, you know obligations. It it's it's made to Russia to to Russian banks and, and Russian companies that it might not be able to collect on now. So I think what you're going to see is you're going to see over the next month, maybe two months, or or at, at the latest end of these, uh, the first quarter earnings that are coming up, you know, in the next couple of uh, next couple of months, you're going to see a lot of banks writing down some of their assets. They're going to say, "Hey, you know, we were owed so much money. We were owed billions of dollars by these Russian companies and, and by Russian banks. We're probably not getting paid on those. So we're going to have to write down those assets. You're going to see a haircut taken by these banks." Uh, but uh, but these banks, you got to remember, banks make money on that uh, long term interest rate. So as long term interest rates go up, you know, as long as they go up more than short term interest rates, you know, so you've got a, you've got a profit margin there for the banks, then they will start making money and they will be able to make money. So, you know, financials have done well, relatively, uh, relatively well against the rest of the market. They've been some kind of safety, even though they've fallen 6.8 percent so far this year. It's still a hell of a lot better than the almost 12 percent down the S&P 500 is and some of these other sectors. And that's what I would be looking at, um, you know, so far for, for the rest of the year. Uh, consumer staples also, even though they were down hard last week, uh, still only down 7% for the year. So some, some relative safety in consumer staples. And again, I think, you know, this is the time to start picking up those big, those high dividend yields in those consumer safety, uh, you know, companies. Um, so, so we talked about banks. I uh, want to talk about what to watch this week. What uh, what am I watching this week, and uh, and some of the stocks I'm watching there, you know. So uh, 
probably no relief this week. You know, I'm sorry. Uh, the Fed does meet. It starts to raise interest rates. Again, at one point, I was thinking maybe that we could get a relief rally as the, as the Fed started to raise those interest rates and the market said, hey, you know what? Interest rates are going up. Deal with it. It's not hurting the economy yet. So uh, it's really no big deal. Okay. That's what you usually see when the Fed starts to hike rates in that red rate hike cycle. Now, of course, you know, Putin and uh, the Russian government has thrown all of that into flux and uh, we're probably not going to see any kind of a relief. You know, the Fed is uh, is expected to go a little bit slower because of Ukraine. It's probably going to raise by a quarter of a percent, so 0.25 percent interest rates this month and uh, and kind of a slow as you go approach just to make sure that uh, inflation and the rest of this uh, this situation isn't hurting the economy. So maybe a little bit slower rate hike uh, approach from the Fed. Again, if Putin is under no real pressure to negotiate, uh, evidenced by, by the uh, Ukraine ambassador's uh, comments over recent talks that, that Russia is just in a reality of its own when it comes to negotiating. Uh, so I, I do think, uh, I do think you, we've got at least a couple of weeks before any serious negotiations do take place on Ukraine. Of course, that is just gonna keep this market on its toes, keep it uncertain. Um, some of the th other things that, you know, economically, uh, the producer price index, the PPI is reported this week. That's kind of the follow-up to the consumer price index, kind of gives us another reading on inflation, but it's really an afterthought, right? Uh, it's not as important as the, the later in the month personal consumption expenditures, which is the the inflation report that the Fed, the Federal Reserve watches to make its interest rate decisions. Uh, and it's obviously not as, not as popular as the consumer price index. So, you know, it's, it's obviously going to be high this week uh, when that PPI comes out, but it's really an afterthought compared to these other two inflation measures. Uh, and, and again, that just means that the, uh, the relief rally probably isn't happening uh, this week, even though stocks are trading higher today, uh, you're still going to have a lot of that uncertainty that, uh, that we're watching at. I want to look now at uh, some of the stocks I'm watching for the, uh, you know, for this week. One, we'll look at a Alibaba Group, Alibaba Group Holdings. And this is one I've actually got a video coming out on Wednesday talking about Chinese stocks, a full analysis of Alibaba, uh, why I call it a lottery ticket investment and why I actually did uh, end up buying some shares. I bought some shares this morning of Alibaba shop, uh, Alibaba stock. It's down 6.8%, down to almost to $80 a share at this point. Uh, and, and we'll talk more about this later, but a lot of what's happening to these Chinese companies, these Chinese stocks, is the SEC announced last week the first list of five stocks that could be delisted as soon as 2024. Uh, and the reason why it made that announcement is these uh, those five stocks, and we'll talk about those, those five stocks actually uh, filed their annual reports, but didn't make it possible for the PCAOB, okay, the U.S. Uh, regulatory body that audits the auditors, the accounting auditors here in the U.S., didn't make it possible for them to have any kind of oversight on those annual reports, okay? So that really starts the clock ticking on delisting for those stocks. And what, uh, what a lot of investors are looking at is that even though maybe Alibaba wasn't on that list of uh, the first five stocks to possibly be delisted, it's likely coming up, okay? It's likely gonna be coming up that the SEC is gonna announce that, hey, you know, Alibaba and some of these other stocks have filed their annual reports. There was no uh, no auditing by the PCAOB and, uh, and they are at risk of being delisted. Okay, so watch for that video on Wednesday. Uh, again, not necessarily saying that, uh, that you should invest in the stock. You need to know what it means to be a lottery ticket investment and where the risks are and how to value that. Another stock I'm watching here, Etsy, and Etsy down uh, just slightly in the uh, in the market today, down just half a percent. But Etsy surged 32 percent. We'll come back out here to the uh, to the one month, and uh, and you can see the real volatility and craziness in the stock surged 32 percent after reporting its first fourth quarter earnings in late February. Uh, you know, investors loved that uh, loved that report. They were one of the few growth companies, the few growth stocks to uh, to report a positive outlook on their uh, you know on their growth for this year. Uh, really, really uh, raised the stock, raised the price on that stock. But it's since given up twenty five percent since in March. Okay, with a twenty percent loss in last week alone, it's really followed the rest of the rest of the growth stocks down lower. Okay. 
And so that's really what I'm looking for lately in some of these growth stocks, okay? Two things I'm looking for in growth stocks right now. One is that uh, they have positive earnings, okay? They are actually making money and uh, it's not just, you know, the, the stock price isn't based just on the hope that someday this company will be profitable, okay? Etsy, a lot of these other growth stocks, uh, Teladoc, uh, they are already in positive, they are already reporting positive net income or positive earnings, okay? They've got, uh, they've still got that 15, 20, 25% annual growth rate in their sales. Uh, but the other thing that I'm watching here is that, uh, you know, investor sentiment in the stock. Can the stock move higher on their earnings report? You know, are they saying the, the things that investors want to hear during earnings about the outlook for 2022 and beyond that investors like to hear? Okay. Uh, so are they making positive progress? on that. Now, I don't care if the rest of the market uh, crashes and brings this stock down lower with it, okay? You know, that 25% drops in March on shares of Etsy, uh, you know, it is it is really a factor of, you know, it is really from the rest of the market pulling it down, uh, you know, with the rest of the growth stocks. So what I'm looking at is I think that's really a market, a market theme, not necessarily a company-specific theme, um, I think, you know, it's the, the management and the company is doing what it needs to do to continue to grow and continue to grow those earnings and sales. Um, you know, and, and if the market just keeps on falling, hey, that's what the market is going to do. But eventually, uh, when the market sentiment turns around, these shares are going to uh, are going to jump once again. Uh, also looking at uh, the the COVID uh, the COVID vaccine makers. And this is really interesting. Actually, uh, shares of Moderna, Moderna are up uh, about 12, 13 percent so far uh, today. But I'm actually looking at so that's MRNA. That's Moderna Inc. MRNA up up about uh, 17, 18 percent today. Uh, Moderna on uh, on news of an HIV treatment that they you know some some people they're signing up for an HIV treatment. Okay. Uh, announced first participant dosed in phase one study of its HIV trimmer mRNA vaccine. Okay, so this is really the next thing for Moderna. Uh, one thing that I've been talking about over the last year, actually over the last two years, when we're talking about these COVID vaccine makers, is that, uh, you know, I, I much more preferred Pfizer. I've held shares of Pfizer. Uh, because it's got that pipeline. Okay, Moderna, it was always kind of a one-trick pony, okay? And and really what we're seeing here is, uh, you know, anytime, anytime the, the COVID and coronavirus kind of ebbs off, uh, then Moderna shares just fall, fall off a cliff, okay? It's like the second worst performer in the S&P 500, you know, for, the, for this year. Uh, what we're seeing here with Moderna is they're actually finally saying, hey, we're increasing our pipeline. We've got this other study in the mix, uh, you know, in trials. And so potentially, eventually, we will be able to get higher sales on some of these other drugs not related to COVID. Uh, what I like, though, you know, what I, I'm really looking at is shares of Pfizer, you know, shares of Pfizer, other COVID uh, vaccines. You know, it, it, it seems that over the last year, it seems that this just happens all the time. OK, we get uh, we get a new variant of the vaccine or of the COVID of coronavirus where everybody starts talking about vaccines again. Everybody starts talking about booster shots and, and you know, a fourth shot and things like that. And these co vaccine makers just surge. All right. Until, you know, of course, until that variant starts to die down again and these uh, these vaccine makers are sold off. So I think, you know, despite the four and a half percent increase in shares of Pfizer today, I think you start looking at this once again. You know, Pfizer has a great pipeline. It's got a lot of other drugs, a lot of other uh, things in trial that will help it grow those sales and grow those earnings even after COVID, even after coronavirus. But I do think, you know, obviously Omicron is not going to be the last variant we see. We are eventually going to see another variant of the COVID virus, of the coronavirus uh, come up. People are going to start talking about these vaccine makers once again, and you're going to see these shares jump back up into, uh, you know, up into the high. You do get a 3.2% dividend yield while you wait, so it's a great dividend yield and a good long-term stock. Some other things uh, I want to talk about here today. Uh, we'll talk about crypto real quick, and what we're seeing in crypto is uh, really some some real you know, real movement on the regulatory area. Of course, all, this, all the skeptics last week were sounding the usual alarm uh, ahead of unveiling of the president's executive order on cryptocurrencies, right? Warning that this is going to be the final straw that breaks Bitcoin and drives it to zero. You know, it's a tune they've, they've been playing for more than a decade and it just hasn't happened. And it didn't happen last week either. You know, in fact, what we saw last week is cryptocurrencies initially jumped on the potential for clarity in those regulations, right? And the reality that 
that the, of a government that has neither the power nor the will to kill this asset class. Okay, we've got 16% of the US population, uh, 24 million people investing in cryptocurrencies, 300 million worldwide. Um, no government wants to be the, you know, the party that kills cryptocurrency. Okay, the, the president's executive order came out and far from any anti-crypto language, the order actually talked up the competitive benefits of cryptocurrency, of blockchain technology, and tasked the Department of Commerce, this is a quote, with establishing a framework to drive U.S. competitiveness and leadership in leveraging these digital asset technologies. Okay, so far from the, uh, you know, far from the, the death knell for crypto that it, that it was going to be. We've also gotten positive statements like that from the EU. The EU actually took out a, uh, a, a language in, a, in an upcoming draft of cryptocurrency regulation that would have banned Bitcoin on some of that on that proof of work concept. They actually took that language out from, uh, you know, from pressure from investors and from the industry. You know, so we are actually seeing the regulatory uh, movement on that. And why that's important, why that's important for crypto here, folks, is because, you know, what is the major factor that is keeping institutional money managers, those pension funds, those endowments and wealth managers, the main thing that is keeping them out of uh, putting their clients' money in cryptocurrency is the regulatory environment, that uncertainty around regulations, okay? They don't know if the government is gonna kill cryptocurrency or it's gonna try or what kind of what kind of uh, environment they're gonna have on it. So once we do get this, uh, this clarity in regulation and regulatory framework, then you're gonna see all that money from institutionals. That's like $103 trillion worldwide that institutional money managers control. You're gonna see a lot of that money coming into uh, into Bitcoin and into other cryptocurrencies, okay? Uh, did a uh, Bitcoin forecast just last week, a video that, uh, that looked at it, and just 2.5% allocation from the institutional side, okay, from institutional man money managers, wealth managers, just 2.5% allocation to cryptocurrency would add another $200,000 to the price of Bitcoin. Okay, so this is definitely a positive, uh, positive movement for, uh, for cryptocurrency and for Bitcoin. Uh, we do. I do want to talk about uh, that bank exposure that we were talking about to Russia and and you know so a possible uh, a possible weakness in the bank stocks. Okay, so it was reported last week that uh, you know a lot of these a lot of the Western banks, uh, BlackRock funds lost about seventeen billion dollars due to its Russian exposure, and that was just the funds though. Uh, that's j just the tip of the iceberg. They say here actually the Bank of International Settlements, which really tracks bank uh, debts and, you know, bank credits and uh, bank information says that Western banks, so that's banks in the U.S. and banks in uh, Europe, are owed uh, uh, $14.7 billion by Russian companies, okay? And what we're seeing is uh, this economic war that, uh, you know, between the West, between Russia, okay? A lot of these companies pulling out of their Russian assets, uh, just really letting them stay there. And uh, Russia is actually starting to say, hey, you know, if Western companies and Western banks pull out of their Russian assets, if they abandon these assets, then Russia and the Russian companies are, you know, within their rights to confiscate these assets, really expropriate these assets. Uh, so I think, again, what you're going to see here is uh, in the next couple of months, you're going to see a lot of the banks, a lot of the banks like Citigroup, which has the largest exposure by far of $10 billion. Okay, Citigroup, is by far the largest uh, largest expo exposure to Russia, uh, Russian banks, Russian companies. Ten billion dollars there. I think you're going to see Citigroup as well as a lot of other banks. Uh, Society Gen Society General um, is owed twenty one billion dollars there in Europe. You're going to see a lot of these banks writing down their assets, saying, "Hey, you know what? We don't think we're going to get paid on uh, all that we're owed from Russian banks, from Russian companies. So we're going to write down the value of these assets. We're going to take a hit now." Uh, you know, if we do end up getting those assets, some of those assets back, then that's great. But we don't think we're going to get those assets. So we're going to write down uh, the value of the company. And you're going to see, you know, you're going to see uh, the stocks of those companies, of those banks sell off, you know, leading up to that uh, on any rumors that this could happen and how much asset write down these, these banks are going to have to make. Uh, but then again, I think that's the point you really start to pick up these shares of these banks like Citigroup, like Bank of America, uh, Sokgen, some of these other banks that make those write downs. I think you're going to see uh, you're going to see the, the the share price do better for the rest of the year on those higher interest rates. So I do think you uh, you can you can jump into those. Uh, I want to talk about another uh, kind of another trend that I'm watching here. 
And what we've taught, uh, you know, all you out there in the nation know, you know, I love following these mega trends, right? One of the best ways to in invest is finding these forces, these trends that are developing over the next 10 years and really going to guide, you know, guide the rest of the, the economy and, and really guide our lives over the next 10 years, investing in those trends and the companies that are going to benefit. OK, because, you know, obviously these these forces, these mega trends carry the weight of trillions of dollars uh, behind them and they're going to boost any stock within that theme, within that trend. OK, whether it was the Internet in the 90s, whether it was, uh, you know, electric vehicles um, just recently, whether it's demographic trends like the aging population. Uh, one of these trends that I'm watching right now and the trend that really fewer few people are talking about just yet, but I think this is going to be one of the big themes over the next 10 years is the labor market situation is the workforce shortage. Okay, there is just not going to be enough workers. All right. Uh, even, you know, even if things improve, and I do, I do expect the coming uh, jobs reports uh, released first Friday of every month, uh, the coming jobs reports are going to be very positive are going to be very strong. But we just do not have enough workers. Okay, uh, let's look at a, looked at a, a Wall Street Journal article last week. Labor Department uh, last Wednesday reported that U.S. employers had seasonally adjusted had 11.3 million job openings in uh, as of the last day of January. Okay, 11.3 million jobs open in the U.S. against uh, and, and that is still that's that's still um, 1.7 position, open positions for each of the six and a half million active job seekers. Okay. There are only six and a half million uh, Americans out there unemployed, actively looking for work for these 11.3 million job openings. Okay. So you see here the graph, this is a graph of job openings per unemployed person. Okay. You can see that has jumped all the way to about 1.7. Okay. And, uh, you know, before you see this, this, the steady increase in that, uh, jobs per unemployed person, that's really, uh, on the weight of all the baby boomers retiring over the last two decades. We were actually in 2000, we were at about, you know, about 0 0.6, 0 0.8, uh, jobs open per unemployed person. So, so more unemployed people than there were jobs. Uh, but that is, that is since started to increase before the pandemic, we were at 1.2 jobs per, uh, per unemployed person. Uh, but again, you know, just uh, just in this this great resignation, they're calling it is, is up to one point seven. And the thing here, though, the thing you got to understand here, even if uh, even if the great resignation turns out to be a fluke, people go back into the workforce uh, and we get labor force participation back up. There are still not going to be enough jobs available. You know, even if even if we get the labor force participation rate, so all these people that quit work and haven't come back to uh, work and and aren't looking for jobs over the past year during the pandemic, even if they come back, that uh, jobs opening per unemployed person is still going to be about one point three percent, one point three jobs per unemployed person. That is still going to be highest, the highest it's been since twenty in twenty years. Uh, highest has been probably on on record for as long as data has been collected. So what you want to look for here, and this is, I think this is one of the real trends that you need to be watching over the next, uh, you know, over the next two or three or five years and really investing in this is the companies that can, uh, that can, that can provide products and services to help boost productivity, right? Look for the industries with the largest labor shortages here. Okay. So the, the company, the industries that are having the biggest trouble, the biggest problems finding workers are transportation, healthcare and the accommodation and food services industries. Okay. So transportation, think trucking companies, think delivery companies, the companies using all those drivers to, uh, you know, to, to, to pick up and, and drop off stuff, healthcare, you know, nurses, uh, doctors having a huge labor shortage in healthcare and then the accommodation and food services industry. Okay. A lot of the waiters, a lot of the service industry, things like that, huge, uh, labor shortage in those three industries. Then what you want to do is you want to research and find the companies developing products for these industries to get more done with fewer workers. Okay. We're talking about things like robotics, artificial intelligence, automated vehicles, and virtual healthcare. Okay. It's one of the reasons why I am so bullish on Teladoc holdings. You know, I've got Teladoc. I've been buying over the last couple of months uh, as the stock came down further uh, because, you know, we, we, we are being forced into that idea of virtual healthcare. Okay. We were in it during the pandemic because we were all locked down. Uh, but over the next 10 years, we're going to be forced to use more virtual healthcare because we just don't have enough nurses. We don't have enough doctors to accommodate, to, to, to serve all these patients and, and things like that. Okay. So really dig into this theme because I think this is, this is really where the, uh, one of the mega trends over the next decade is going to be.
Now, I do want to uh, turn it over to a question and answer, Q&A, uh, one of my favorite parts of the live stream, just kind of connecting with you out there in the community. I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to I'm going to scroll up here to see if I uh, got any comments, any questions. If I don't see your question, please ask it in in the chat. Uh, make sure you use a question mark so I can see uh, where, where it's at, uh, you know, that, that it is a question. ISR wants to know, do I offer one on one portfolio management? I'm sorry, I don't uh, used to work private wealth management virtual uh, and uh, venture capital, things like that. Did a lot more one-on-one -on -one with clients and things like that. But but right now, you know, I just don't have the time to work one-on-one. -on -one. I am actually, uh, the end of this week, I'll probably be announcing a, a, a more a groups, group chats, group sessions, uh, you know, kind of a three-month program with uh, limited to 15 people uh, in, in each three-month period. Uh, so we'll have a lot more one-on-one. -on -one. Really looking forward to getting to getting to that uh, that face to face and back and forth kind of thing. Uh, so look for that uh, at the end of this week. I will be announcing that through the newsletter. So make sure you sign up with the uh, the link that I've left in the chat or in the description below. Uh, I'll be announcing that first with the newsletter as well as in our private Facebook group. Uh, that kind of that kind of group chat opportunity. Uh, what else do we have? Uh, how are you? Love the good morning. Uh, Octavia says, good morning from Connecticut. See you there. Um, Palantir, a goodbye. Uh, DDP or DIP wants to know if Palantir is goodbye. I actually did a start, share a video on Palantir. Look for that as a couple weeks ago. Just go to the video section on the channel. Uh, you're going to see a Palantir video there uh, talking really about how I think it was really max fear in the stock. Okay, We saw uh, ARK Invest, the ARK Invest funds and Kathy Wood completely sell out of all their Palantir shares. Of course, it was like the day before the stock bounced, uh, which I think was a big mistake by ARK Invest. But, um, but I think that kind of indication, that kind of signal really signals max fear in those shares when everybody, even the biggest cheerleaders in that stock give up that's when you want to start buying. Okay, so so I did do a video uh, on the full analysis on that and and why you can start looking at at that stock to uh, to pick those up. What else? Oh, there's Timothy, fellow devil, devil dog, hurrah, hurrah, brother. Uh, how do you feel about leveraged ETFs like the TQQ and the SQQ? Okay, so a couple things to remember about these leveraged ETFs. What he's talking about here, and, and I can go over into. Uh, into Yahoo Finance and kind of show you here things like this TQQQ. This is the ProShares Ultra QQQ, uh, and we also have the SQQQ, which is the short, uh, the short QQQ. And basically, what these funds do, these funds. Okay, so here we have the ProShares Ultra Pro Short QQQ, the SQQQ ticker. And what these funds do, uh, they take, uh, they buy futures and options to uh, to mimic. And to get a leveraged bet on the, in this case, it's the QQQ, right? The NASDAQ 100 index. Okay, so what this ProShares Ultra Pro Short QQQ is doing, it is buying, uh, you know, selling uh, selling options, sell, buying puts or selling calls or, uh, you know, doing working in the futures market against the NASDAQ 100, trying to get a leveraged return, usually two or three times whatever happens in the uh, in the NASDAQ. Okay, so for example, Nasdaq up a quarter of a percent today. This uh, this is down 1.3, 1.4%, 1 right? Because it's a short one. So this fund is going to do better when the Nasdaq is down. It is going to get two or three times uh, the inverse uh, of the uh, of the Nasdaq. We'll go to a little bit easier one here. T Q Q Q. This is the uh, ProShares Ultra. So this is the other side of that bet. This is trying to get the leveraged upside to the Nasdaq 100. So this is going to rise about two or three times. Uh, whatever the rise is in the NASDAQ. And you can see it's doing that pretty well here today, One point up 1.2% 1 against a 0.3% uh, return in the NASDAQ. Now, a couple things to, uh, to understand here. These are very much uh, for traders and, and for short-term investments in these uh, in these kinds of uh, kinds of ideas, okay. If you do think you know the Nasdaq is going to continue to fall, or some of these other stocks are going to fall, uh, then you would want to you would maybe want to take a position in that SQQQ, okay. Uh, and that would one you might be able to profit from as stocks fall, 
or it might just kind of uh, protect you from the downside in some of your stocks. So it's a hedging kind of thing as well. You know, if you own a lot of growth stocks, a lot of tech stocks that you're worried about falling, then uh, if you were to buy that SQQQ, then that would benefit as the as your other stocks fell. Okay, so it's much more of a trading, a hedging kind of idea. The reason why I say it's only for short short term trades or short term ideas is because these funds do tend to underperform what they're supposed to do over the longer run, okay? So over a year, over a two year period, you are not gonna get that two times leverage on uh, on this, this fund, okay? It's gonna kind of break down because it is so expensive to manage. It is so expensive to constantly be having to buy those futures, buy those options, do things like that. The strategy is very expensive, so it isn't going to provide that exact two or three times leverage over the longer term. Uh, you can also see this expense ratio, 0.95%, almost a 1% expense ratio, one of the highest you'll find in ETFs, in exchange traded funds. So, you know, not a bad thing if you really do have a strong feeling on the direction of the market, or you want to hedge, or you want a, that hedged risk, uh, you know, on your portfolio, then these are something you can look into. Um, I don't use them a whole lot because generally what I'll do instead is if I do want that hedge, then maybe I'll sell some calls myself or maybe I'll buy some puts myself. You know, I'll do that hedging myself in the options market rather than buying these these ETFs. But it is an option. It is a solution uh, for you if you want that short term, that short term trade or that short term uh, protection. What else do we have here? Uh, <clears throat> scrolling through some of these questions here. Uh, you ever look into SoFi? Uh, Medi Momin wants to know if I look into SoFi. I've actually bought shares of SoFi over the last month. Uh, SoFi is one of my favorite stocks, gro favorite growth stocks. You, you remember at the beginning of the live stream, I did talk about putting half of my new money each month into some of those growth stocks. SoFi is one of them. Teladoc is, is another one of them that I'm actively buying. Things like that. Uh, SoFi, so that's ticker SOFI. Um, it is, you know, it is really got a, a strong lead on the future of banking. Okay, it's one of the vert, one of the few fintech companies, so the financial technology uh, companies, in the virtual virtual banks, as you, uh, if you will, as one of the few that actually has a banking license. Okay, it bought a bank last year, uh, so it actually has a banking license. It can provide some of those traditional financial products, uh, you know, to to help it to help it increase its revenue, increase its earnings, things like that. So definitely look at SoFi. One thing that is hurting SoFi right now is that it started out as a student loan uh, provider, right? A student loan lender. It was lending money for student loans. It was consolidating student loans. Uh, so, and it still has a lot of its business in that area, okay? Well, obviously, you know, with nobody paying back their student loans over the last year and that's still being pushed back, those payments on student federal student loans being pushed back, it is hurting SoFi. Okay, so that's the biggest thing right now in shares of SoFi is that their earnings, their sales are artificially low because of that moratorium on uh, on student loan paybacks. Once that gets lifted, and it eventually will, okay, people have to start restart paying their student loans. Okay, that's gonna happen. Once that happens, and once that announcement is made, SoFi shares are gonna take off. And I think this, even more important, this is a stock for the future. This is one of those growth stocks that is really gonna grow over the next 10 years, and this is, I think this is one you, you wanna be in. Okay, uh, I can't believe the money. Sean, Sean, uh, not just because your time in the Marines. Okay, hoorah, devil dog. There you go. Uh, thoughts on JPM. Warren wants to know, uh, thoughts on J JP Morgan. Finance has dropped, but thinking it should rise on higher interest rates later this year. Uh, great, great question. Uh, and, and yeah, you know, you're exactly right on those interest rates. Uh, you know, as interest rates rise, I do think the banks and the financials do better. Uh, one thing you do got to understand, though, with banks, when you're investing in any banks, whether it's JP Morgan, Bank of America, Citigroup, anything like that, you really got to make the distinction between capital market banks and consumer commercial banks, co co uh, consumer lending banks, okay? Um, they're going to, they're, they're both going to do well, probably, but what you got to understand is those capital market banks. Okay. So we're talking the banks that really make most of their money off of, uh, trading stock markets, uh, invest, uh, investment banking, things like that. Uh, they are, you know, things like JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Credit Suisse, those come, those, those are much more tied to the capital market. Okay. So they're going to follow the stock market a little bit more closely uh, as far as stock price returns and things like that. 
the commercial banks. Now, those are the banks that get most, of, and there is some some overlap. Okay, obviously, J.P. Morgan has banks uh, that that lend money to consumers, smaller businesses, things like that. There is overlap here, but we're just talking about kind of the the bulk of their earnings of their sales. Okay. And so you've got the other banks like Bank of America, like uh, Wells Fargo, like uh, your smaller community banks, like Huntington, Huntington Bank Shares. Okay, those smaller banks, those commercial banks, they get most of their money off of lending, off of uh, you know lending to small business, off of lending to consumers. Okay, and I think that's where if you're looking at the interest rate increase, that's where you want to be. Okay, because that's where you're going to see the biggest rise in those profits. Okay, the banks that are making the most money off of those loans. Uh, the most percentage share of their total money, of their total revenue, that's where you're going to see the biggest hit, uh, you know, the biggest rise on that. So I would, rather than maybe JP Morgan or Credit Suisse or uh, Goldman Sachs, uh, which are capital market banks, I think you're going to you're going to see a lot better returns in some of these these other banks uh, and great valuations right now as well. Uh, what else we do have a, a super chat here, Michael, uh, appreciate that $5 super chat. How do you feel about UGA after the $11 drop? Uh, you know, I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll go over real quick here. I, I'm not familiar with the stock actually. Uh, UGA, UGA is United States gasoline fund. Ah, okay. So, you know, of course this is kind of what we were talking about in the, uh, you know, in the, in the earlier, the lead up talking about commodity prices, talking about oil, um, there are funds and there are ways to invest directly in oil, gasoline, gold, uh, obviously, you know, the GLD, the spider gold shares, uh, things like that, where you can actually get that direct exposure into uh, into these commodities here with the United States Gasoline Fund, UGA, I'm a, I'm. I know they, they buy futures contracts on gasoline, you know, so it's basically by like, if you didn't want to buy futures yourself, then you could buy this ETF and it's supposed to follow the price of gasoline. And the risk here, the real risk here, folks, is that you're just late to the trade. You know, by the time everybody hears about, hey, gasoline surged uh, last week or oil prices surged last week to $130 a barrel, then you know, it's a, it's a lot of times it's already a very crowded trade. Okay, so this is very something very hard to follow. I used to trade futures myself, uh, and it was just a nightmare. Okay, I got to tell you, folks, anytime you're playing in that futures market, buying the futures, uh, and I consider this kind of the same thing, right? Because you're buying an ETF, you're buying a fund, but that fund is totally invested in futures. So this is like buying futures. And uh, those things run at like 23 hours a day, you know, futures trade 23 hours of the day. Uh, so I would be up at two in the morning, just waiting for some economic data to drop out of China to see how my copy copper futures went. Or, you know, one morning I woke up and I had lost like $8,000 overnight because a refinery in Canada blew up and gas prices jumped. Okay. So, so this is the, that's the kind of stress and the kind of anxiety you can get from futures. Um, and really, if you're going to play in futures, if you're going to play in these funds, you really have to have some kind of an advantage, uh, you know, really deep research into these commodities, into either energy com commodities, agricultural commodities. You really need a reason to believe that you know where prices are going better than the millions of other investors that are in the futures market. Okay, so again, what I, you know, I, while I don't necessarily recommend investing in futures or some of these ETFs, the gas fund, the, um, the you know, the USO, which is the oil fund, or the GLD, which is the gold fund, uh, I do think you can still take advantage of these trends in these commodity prices by buying the miners, by buying the oil explorers and the energy companies, okay? Because again, even if these prices come down, even if the, the price of gasoline does come down, then you know, you've got the refiners making money. Even if the price of oil comes down, you've got the explorers still making money. You've got the gold miners still making money. I really think that's what you do uh, with these. You know, it sucks to be uh, after, a, uh, you know, after an $11 drop in these, uh, this United States gasoline fund. So we can see here, I mean, we can see it just exploded here with a higher gas prices for, off of the Ukraine situation, but is now down from $66 down to 55. That $11 drop, uh, if you bought in at 66, you're now down, uh, what is it, about 12% on that, which sucks. Uh, but you know, unless you have a real clear idea and clear understanding that uh, that gasoline uh, could jump back up, and it might. You know, like I said, I don't think Ukraine is nearly over. I do think uh, gas prices have a good chance, a good probability of going higher. 
uh, you know, especially as we see the rest of uh, this bleed through uh, inflation. Uh, but you really do need to have a, a good idea of of where uh, where oil or where these commodities are going to to really you know do these uh, you know do these uh, these futures and these futures type bets. What else? But great question. Uh, you know on that. Uh, <clears throat> Abel Abel wants to know: Buy Amazon now before or after the split? Why not both? You know. I um, actually talked about Amazon in our chat last week, in our live stream last week. Uh, who is the, uh, the act? There's an activist investor. Uh, I, I can't remember the name right now. We talked about it last week. Activist investor says shares of Amazon could be worth as much as twice uh, what they are now. Let's actually, we can go actually go over to the uh, chart on Amazon. I should probably just leave it on here on Yahoo Finance and we'll talk through these. Uh, Amazon trading about $2,900 right now, about $1.5 trillion market cap. The activist investor we talked about last week says it could be worth as much as two and a half trillion. Okay, what he says, what, what we talked about is the, the idea that the cloud services segment, so Amazon Web Services, one of the biggest growth segments of Amazon right now, he's saying that that alone is worth one and a half trillion. And then the e-commerce part of the business is worth another trillion. Okay, so if you've got a two and a half trillion dollar valuation, <clears throat> or a two and a half trillion dollar fair value of this company, it's trading at one and a half trillion right now. That is a 66, 67 percent return on the shares. Okay, he's saying he's saying Amazon should be worth upwards of five thousand dollars a share. Okay, and I actually, you know, Amazon is one of those stocks that is always, uh, you know, always put me back. Uh, okay. Uh, I've, I've always looked at Amazon shares, looked at the valuation on these things. They were always trading at 10 times plus price to sales, huge, uh, you know, 30, 30, 50, 60 times price to earnings. And I could never, uh, I, I could never bring myself to invest in Amazon. Of course it is always, it was continued to increase. I think at this point, Amazon is actually in value territory. Okay. If you look at, you know, the past, uh, the past valuation on Amazon, um, Right now, it is trading at under three times on a price to sales basis. So we'll go here to the statistics. You can see Amazon now trading 3.3 times on a price to sales. It's still pretty expensive, almost 50 times on a trail on a price to earnings basis. But this is one of the cheap, as about as cheap as we've seen in Amazon, uh, you know, for forever, for decades. Uh, we can actually go to. I've got a Morningstar plan here. Uh, we can actually look into the history of Amazon valuations, where that price to sales and where that price to earnings has traded uh, in the past. Go here to valuation and uh, we'll increase the size here. I don't know if you can see this, but uh, but we, okay, we'll scroll over here. Okay, this uh, so right now, 3.2, 3.3 times on a price to sales basis. Five-year average is 3.9 times. And you can see, I mean, it's traded as high as 4.8 times. It's traded, uh, you know, it's traded right around there, about three, four. It's traded a little bit lower, around three times price to sales. Uh, price to earnings, it's traded as high as 100 times. 95 to here, 2017, Amazon was trading for 300 times on a price to earnings basis. So here at, you know, 3.2 times sales, 45 times on a price to, price to earnings, Amazon is actually looking uh, looking pretty attractive on a valuation basis. Okay, obviously we got that big news last week that it would split its shares 20 for one. Uh, and, and I do think you take advantage of that. You buy into the shares uh, now. Uh, I think it's gonna bring in a lot of investors once that share price is down lower. So uh, so 20, it's gonna be three, it's gonna be 15, it's gonna be about $150 a share, right? Uh, 3,000 divided by 20. Yep, going to be about $150 a share when it does drop. I say, hey, get on a platform, get on an investing platform that allows you to buy fractional shares so you don't have to buy $3,000 worth of Amazon, uh, you know, uh, if you if you don't have the money or if you don't want to. Get on a share, uh, 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 you know, an investing platform like Webull or like pretty much all of them uh, that allows you to buy fractional shares, buy whatever you want, you know, $150, buy, buy $200 worth of Amazon, start buying it now, start accumulating it now every month with a little bit of money. And, uh, and I, I think this is a stock that's got a lot of value locked inside that, that could be higher, uh, you know, really soon. What else? <clears throat> Looking through the uh, the chat here, uh, looking for other questions. Yeah, you know, if you've if you've got more than if you've got more than 
uh, more than five years here, folks. Again, I, I say you, you use that that strategy that we talked about earlier in the video. You know, right off the bat, I, I shared that exact strategy of what I'm doing with my money. You invest invest every single month, or you deposit money into your account every month. Keep that habit of constantly and consistently depositing money from your paycheck into your investing account. But do not do not feel the urge to jump on any stock you hear about or every stock you hear about. You know, let some of that money build up in cash. Use half of your money to buy into the stocks that you feel most most surely, most certain about. Okay, for me, it's a lot of these growth stocks that have sold off 60, 70, 80% over the last year. Uh, stocks that I believe are gonna change our lives over the next 10 years that are at max fear right now. Use half of your new deposits each month to buy more shares of those. Let the other half stay in cash. Okay, set your markers of where you where you're gonna start using that cash so you don't have that constant anxiety and fear every day of watching the market. Should I buy now? Should I buy now? Should I use this cash now? Okay, you need to don't worry about the market, folks. Okay, the market's gonna do what it does, uh, but it will go higher over the long term. That is the 100% guarantee that uh, the market will always go higher eventually over the long term. Okay, so you need to you need to be depositing your money, uh, building your portfolio, and just not worry so much about it. We're going to uh, close it up for this week. I love love seeing you all here every week, 9 a.m. Eastern time with these weekly market updates. Uh, if I didn't see your question, go ahead and ask it in the, uh, in the comments uh, below the video, and I'll try to get to it later today when I'm at the gym. Until then, uh, thank, you for, thank you for being here.